so I have talked about the Buddha story for a while now. Now we're focusing on the students of the Buddha. And I'm following the stories I heard, you know, the Buddha story I heard online and in the book. Yeah, so the top two disciples of the Buddha, because now we look at Buddha, right? We look at him, his, you know, courage to let go, what is comfortable, what is luxurious. And his white, his sharp observing mind, eyes, you know, even his clouded with all this illusion of grandeur, illusion of um, everything is all right, it's fine. He, he still realized something's not quite right. People get old, people get sick, people will die. And there's a path out of that. People trying to get out of this by practicing the path of liberation, stramana, you know, to be a monk, trying to find it within or without, outside. So he went through this, he trials and errors, he went all the way to the most extreme part of it, from the most extreme luxury, having three palaces for three seasons for him, into the extreme ascetism, torturing his body to the point of skeleton, skin wrapping skeleton. There's no meat in it, his body. He's just sitting under trees eating one peanuts and not eating at all for, for months and years. Then he reached back to the point of moderation. This is not the way to go, you know, for too much enjoyment, too much, um, too much enjoyment, too much torturing is not helping, right? That's not the point. The point is how do we tune ourselves where we can focus on the path of enlightenment? This is a long, long road, right? So he fit himself, get himself back in shape, sit down a body tree with all the understanding and knowledge. Now he sat on the tree and he make a very strong determination. I am going to get this done and I'm going to get it done. Otherwise, I will not stand up again from this seat. That means he will he put 100% of himself into this path. It's do or die, basically. All right? That's the level of courage we need to have if you want to be Buddha. If you want to be going to Pure Land, same thing. Do or die. All right? Every person who go to Pure Land has that cultivation. Even it's just the last moment because when they chant Amitabha, they let go of everything, literally everything, the love there and stuff like that. Those emotions and everything, they let go. It's hard when you're in it right, for 20 years, 30 years. Right? When you practice Amitabha, we still think about my son, my daughter, my my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my 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 pets, my cats, stuff like that. You you your wandering thoughts is there, right? Using Amitabha voice to understand why do we need to get off here? Listen to what Master Ching Kong saying is to understand how important is it, it is to let go. Because in the end of the day, nothing really will stay with you. Not saying that you should not have good time with them, but you understand that it will not last. And nothing's wrong with that. This is way of life. You appreciate each other, but you understand you need to do something more than that if you have a choice. If you don't know about it, of course, you enjoy your life, right? If you have good marriage, you will have a good life. But something's got to be more than that. We have that opportunity. We have that encounter, right? We have this opportunity. You can't just not do it. It's 对不起自己. That's what he's trying to say, Master Jingo, for 60 years. That's his sentiment, right? You can't do yourself unjust by not doing it, not even trying, that's wrong. Yes, you may not be have 100% like a Buddha, like, you know, the um, uh, six patriarch, you know, Liu Zuhui, and that level of dedication of cutting off his arms in order to get the Zen, doesn't have to do that. Those are gestures. Those are, for us, it's gestures. For him, it's real. He, he's willing to do that. That is that moment he is. Your moment as well is, you know, have that mental preparation. Live about your life, you know, fall in love, get relationships, stuff like that. Whatever the normal lay person needs to go through, go through. If you become a monk, it's in a different story. But go through what human has to go through. But always keep in mind, in the end of the day, you need to let this go. You know, those are journey. And journey, 
is a moment to moment thing. It's over, it's over. We, our mind, that's why you need to, that's why the Alphan works so hard to drive it. Because our mind will always obsess over the same thing, like a broken record, loop and loop. Something like that is bound to happen. We attach to this, to that. So, Chanting Amitra 4, do you realize that? It's like a loop as well. It's like re- re- releasing the recording again and again and again and again. People who don't know my thing, why do we do such boring stuff? Because why are we saying the same thing over and over again? If you understand why, that consistency, that uh, assurance that, you know, if you do it in the, with the right rhythm, that fits you. You like fast, go fast. You like slow, go slow. You, with that rhythm, just like breathing, when you uh, when you very very agitated, anxious, with all the emotions going through, your breathing is not normal. You'll be like, <laughs> you don't know about it. It might be hidden, but your heart is like pumping like crazy, right? All sorts of emotion, fall in love, get angry, uh, jealous, or you know, agitated, worry about someone's things, worry about this, worry about that. Your breathing is not normal. That's why Buddha teaches to deep breathe slowly, maintain the normal breathing, right? It goes with chanting Amitabha as well, right? Chanting Amitabha is not just your mind looping. You also your whole being is with them. So those are basics, you know, to support your path to enlightenment. You know, first, what Tai San Gai Pen teaching, what not to do, what this treatise on response and retribution teaches, do no evil, and then you move up to this meditative tranquility. Maintain that rhythm no matter where you are, what you are facing. That is very hard. I know I'm still, I'm experiencing a lot of emotion lately, but it's very hard to get back to that. Yet, we need to get back to that. You have to have that conviction. I know I can't go back right now because I encounter situations that makes me unable to calm down. So I need to find a way, no matter how weak that is, a little gap I can have of peace I can have to myself so that I can go back or put myself in the environment where I can go back, like put myself into the temple service, forcing myself to do that, even though my mind is wandering. So Buddha did all he can and he achieved enlightenment with, you know, overcoming different obstacles, Mara trying to disturb him. I digress. So once we understand Buddha's enlightenment, his five big su and then expanding to thousands of people and all these Thousands of people, especially when the sutra mentioned 2,500 entourage, Chang Zhong, uh, constant entourage. He always surrounded by this much people, 2,500, most of the time. It's because his top, those people don't come one by one. It's going to take a long time. It's always top people, top leader, right, of that group got convinced, got impressed by the wisdom of the Buddha. They flocked to him with hundreds of 500s of 1,000 of his students. And that's how 2,500 works. Same goes for Confucius. They don't have 2,500 literally one by one every single day say yes, yes, yes. It's one very charismatic leader who really impressed of his teaching, willing to follow him, bring thousands of his students, hundreds of his students. And this accumulates, right? Same goes for company, for empire. Those things happen like that. So back to the point at hand, top two student, so yeah, there are 10 uh, most um, well-achieved students of Buddha. First one is Sariputra, Sarifu. Second one is, uh, right? So Venerable um, Sariputra and Venerable Malgalia Yana. Those two are sages, right? And Venerable Sariputra has um, well known as his wisdom, top wisest, He's the wisest disciple of Buddha. As a wisest disciple, let's read his beginning. He was born uh, to a wealthy family. I think he's a prince or something, like someone with good position. And he, at the age of eight, able to you know understand all the books he's read. He's very smart, you know. Um, and Shariputra has um, been learning since he was young. And at the age of eight, he's already like, I have learned more than I could from book. I need to get out. When he get out, he learn from different teachers, just like Buddha. 
He learned from different teachers, the top scholars, and then eventually he got to a level where he can lead a group himself because his wisdom is unparalleled in a sense of his circle. His wisdom is the top. So he has his own that at the time they haven't followed the Buddha's teaching so they didn't fully understand that full enlightenment. So he has his own group of students entourage under him just like Buddha hundreds of people he himself uh, and Malgalayana Malgalayana uh, both venerables were brothers they were not brothers they were friends from childhood right they studied together and all that so they have to form an entourage themselves of students when they pass by a um, road towards um, I think Rajagaka or maybe a, a city where the Buddha is resting um, he saw the bhiksu right? the monk so dignified and so how to say well positioned poised um, very calm every movement there's no wandering thoughts in it because they are arahants they no longer they have even they, they have full control of their action so it's such a rare sight they can't help but ask who is your teacher what do you teach so they say about well, my teacher taught me about um, you know uh, four noble truth you know, sufferings the, and uh, the accumulation of sufferings the cessation of sufferings the path to enlightenment you know by seizing the sufferings and then talks about the twelve dependent originations those are quite technical terms essentially it talks about you know all conditions, all phenomena arise from conditions. All right, Yichefa using Xiangsen. So basically, he talked about the Buddha's teaching, and they were impressed by the depth, the level of you know the insight. They haven't heard that kind of talk before. We take it for granted nowadays, thanks to the teachers, you know, thanks to generations of venerables spreading it, translating it. Now we still have Master Xinga talking about it. A lot of monks. A lot of Buddhist society, you know, spreading it, right? Back then, it is unheard of, right? And 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 first time they heard that, they were like, "I gotta have to see who is this wise person." So they followed this monk back to the, um, I think it's the the bamboo groove, and then met the Buddha, and they knew down and listened to him, and then they were in, enlisted, they were recruited uh, by the Buddha to the Sangha. So they are achievement very quick. They achieve a lot arahant. So what was behind Shariputra? Because we read Shariputra's story uh, name too many times when we chant the sutra. In Chinese, we call Salifu, right? The Amitabha Sutra, you know, Salifu, Salifu. We always chant Salifu, right? For so Amitabhajing, so basically, we chant for generations, especially Chinese, we chant a lot of sutra that has Shari, uh, Shariputra. It's this name that is day to day, everyone knows. So who is Shariputra? What, was, what makes him so wise? In the past, Shariputra was... Uh, this it's is the um, story where you said um, how they kick his off his... Uh, his eye or something what both eyes one eye ah yes, yes. Person. thank you thank you thank you so much um shariputra has um uh let's say practicing well in the past as well as a monk um he uh practiced the path of liberation uh, the buddhas and one day because he do so well um a uh deva which is the heavenly being, Celestius, came down from heaven, trying to test him. Are you ready for Bod Bodhisattva path? Because you made the vow, all right? And I think he's ready because he's already like Arahan and birth, no longer attached to the body. So what he did is he went to, um, he appeared as one of the normal people and asking for his help. Oh, dear venerable, can you help me, please? My mom is sick. She needs medicine from the eyes of a monk, a enlightened monk in order to save her life you know I need that eyeball from this enlightened monk to be made into grind into medicine so that my mom may survive 
this is the only ailment she can have to help herself to to to, to save her life. So the Shariputra did not think twice, take off his right eye, ball, ball from his socket, and mm-hmm. just give it to him. Of course, um, to test him further, the Deva turned human said to him, "Oh, Shariputra, uh, appears that the right eye is not the right one. Can you give me your left eyes instead?" Because uh, I made a mistake. <laughs> so after taking out his right eyeballs, he'd say, I made a mistake. Um, could you please give me your left eye? So he took out his left eye and gave it to him without thinking, hesitating. So taking after the left eye, and then he's like, this is disgusting. How can anyone use eyeball as a medicine, catalyst, as a, as a medicine? It's unthinkable. So he threw it to the ground, both eyeballs to the ground, and stomped on it. So Shariputra at that moment, of course, he's no longer attached to his body. He's not worried about pain and all that. He's worried about... <sighs> Such is the difficulties of helping the sentient beings in the Saha world. I, I should continue cultivating for only for myself. So I should continue to do the self-cultivation. There's no point to go out and be Bodhisattva to save people others. It's so hard. So immediately, Deva returned to his original form, informing the Shariputra, uh, please don't be uh, discouraged, dear uh, uh, old venerable. Um, this is just a test to see your determination. Basically telling him, yeah, this is not an easy path, but um, keep going. So he has, uh, how to say, give rise to the vow um, to be a Bodhisattva and he was tested uh, with this um, test uh, what else the other one is um, do you still remember other stories from Shariputra I think that's the only one right because Mogalayana has I think that's uh, the one we talked about yeah that's the only one I talk about right um, yeah yeah these are top two disciples by the way that's like if you talk about Buddha's left right hand left hand I mean, right hand I mean is the hand of the Buddha basically who, who helped him to propagate the Dharma these are the top two so Mogalayana is an, another top disciples uh, Mogalayana is friends of Shariputra with him they founded their own entourage they met the monk they joined the Sangha so what happens with Mogalayana past life his life right is and his ending in, as far as we know is not that smooth but in his past life he went by a place a grove he met a Prayeka Buddha which is pizza for Prayeka Buddha in Buddhism means that people who gain enlightenment at least Arahan level and above without needing teachings from a Buddha living Buddha that means that we don't need a Buddha to appear in this world to teach you what is enlightenment uh, you know the path to enlightenment the four noble truth no need they will realize it themselves by just observing the nature surrounding so it's a very sharp um, sharp senses spiritual senses um, usually they use 12 dependent origination which is what I just mentioned 12 dependent origination to observe the world and from outside to inside you know, or from inside to outside. Wu Ming Yuan Xing Xing Yuan Shi Shi Yuan Ming Se Ming Se Yuan Liu Lu. So in Chinese, there's a long string of words we can remember. Wu Ming Xing Shi Ming Se Liu Lu Chu Shou Ai Qu Yu Sheng Si. So basically, from ignorance into you know, 一面一面无名而有啊，一面一面无名嘛。So, sorry, man. I, Buddhism in Chinese culture has been thousands of years. It's part of our blood. So, I remember it in Chinese. So, I'm trying to translate it in English. Um, um, ignorance, right? Give rise to uh, motions, as in motions. How do I describe it? Atomic motions? I don't know. Like, you know, why. They are not steady. They are always moving. You know, science can't explain it. They just observe. They con- constantly pushing and pushing, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling. You know, the Taoist says yin yang and all that. Continue moving around, constantly motion. So, 
this is in Buddhism we call it in uh, wandering thoughts, ignorance, right? There's no need to do that. And and the six patria of the Zen Buddhism they say that the true nature is peace. It's serene, right? There's not um, bound by movements. There's no need by that. They don't follow that rule. But these wandering thoughts arise out of true nature, this Buddha nature, the real self, the real you, you know, so to speak. It's more than what you think you are. It's more. And you know, it is what it is. It's not more and less. It is what it is. It's put and put in, guys. Uh, uh, so it's very metaphysic. It's very, not just metaphysic, it's very, it's there. You can't use your word to describe, but they describe in child dependent origination. From wandering thoughts to, from in, uh, ignorance, which is you move into seeing, seeing yuan shi. So with movements, there are consciousness. And with consciousness, uh, there is forming of materia, you know, wave particles. And wave particles, if you accumulate, it becomes solid material. So from that material, it becomes six senses, right? The five senses and your mind, right? That's the body. So with the six, the body, right? You, there is stimuli and stimu, stimulus. So you, 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 you receive the reception from the outside. So you have that ability to absorb the information, stuff like that. Luru, um, so and then when you touch, get in contact with the outside phenomena, each other or whatever is forming on the outside, as you are being a person or a being, whatever animal realm or heavenly realm, um, you have emotions you have you have feeling you you receiving all this sense you know you touch you receive all these um stimuli that stimulates your senses and then it forms image that image gives rise to feeling right means liu ru chu shou ai and then you start to love or hate your ai jiu hen you love this you hate this you know, you want this, you don't want this. Now, as we say that we are experiencing it, right? I'm not saying that I'm enlightened, I say that we are analyzing our problem or our condition, right? That's how it is, right? You like this, you don't like this. You want this, you don't want this. Okay, that's how it is. So, uh, and then when you love, when you like, you want to have it. When you don't like, you don't want to have it. So, you have this action and then when you want it it becomes something right we can say relationships is the most obvious one we can say um, even physics you know like attractions and repulsions right big bang attractions repulsion I don't know gravity or something those natural phenomena is constantly push and pull push and pull attract or repulse, attract, repulse, right? With that movement, there is energy. With that energy, you can form a lot of things, right? Wind, fire, air. Uh, so, natural world and our human internal world is the same thing, right? It's all related. So, it becomes all this astrology and stuff like that. Why can we predict movements of human life, right? Because... It's all related. Uh, all the body is a small universe. The, the the universe outside is a big universe. It's just a matter of scale, all right? So with these movements, you form into things. And then when you formed, of course, they are unbecoming. When there's become, there's unbecome. So, qu yo. So when you become, you're alive. Why, why are we back alive? Constantly moving, constantly evolving, constantly changing, dynamic. When there is movements, there's also cessation of movements. So it, and then eventually it dies. But it didn't fully die because this thing never happened. This thing is just 
you know, you are still you. However, your form that you attach with has changed. That's it. You attach to this based on what you did, right? So karma comes in that form. If we look at this 12 dependent origination, Wu Ming, uh, Xing, Shi, Ming Se, Liu Ru, Chu, Shou, Ai, Qu, Yo, Sheng, Si. 12. Yes. 12. Yeah, I'm confident. Now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Buddha. So, uh, okay. So now, so now we have this 12 dependent origination. This is what they rely on, right? Without being told. I'm being told. We're all being told about this. Only we realize. They realize that just like they observe it happening as it goes, this 12 progress. They have that deep level of meditation to do that. And that enlightens them. So enlightenment is not some very unfathomable stuff. You can't describe it because you are observing it. The way I say it is already like not doing it justice, right? Because I haven't experienced it. If I experience it, I can go straight to the point. But this is basically the structure of how the world came to be, right? How the world unbe coming. So life and death, like Guan Yin Pusa in her, in Bodhisattva Guan Yin in her Heart Sutra says, you know, the actual um, wisdom Prashna Paramita, when they observe, right? they talk to Shariputra and say, the real true nature is there's no life and death. There's no nothing of that. There's not there's no beginning and ending. It's a circle. There's no starting point or ending point. These are wandering thoughts. These are these are literally conjured out of thin air. Just like your mind. You're thinking out of nowhere. Right? Some, sometimes you sit down and have a tea, suddenly you think about what if I go to um, Mars? Like, what if I become that bird? What brings forward that? You know, there's no, there's no continuation. Um, so this is something you can think about by yourself, like observe, you know, like understand this will give you a little bit of perspective of where you are in your life and why, why this happens. You know, you go along as usual, you still need to follow a bite by a rule, not telling you to do crazy stuff. You still have to subject to the karma law because that's how it works. And but now you're liberated. You no longer get stuck about loss and gain. You are free. You are um, able to see. Anyway, I'm back to the back to Ma, um, uh, Mogalayana. So Venerable Mogalayana observed this, but he didn't observe all of that. He observed him. Prayaka Buddha, who attained, going through this progress, suddenly fly to the air in front of him. So what amazed him or caught his attention is the ability to fly. He's like, I want to be like him. I want to be able to perform miracles like him. Right? And the way he, why he ret- able to attain miracles? We need to talk about this. Why Prayaka Buddha able to p- perform miracles? Even the um, the arahants and the, um, you know the four stages of enlightenment in early Buddhism, they can perform miracles as they as they um, gain light uh, as they reach there as they reach to the four stages. Top stages, fourth stage, they can uh, perform all six. You know, Shen Zhu Tong, Ta Xing Tong, Su Ming Tong, uh, Wu Tong, Liu Tong, the six miracles categorized into six. Right, able to see far, see without obstacle. Here without obstacle, uh, understand what they think with the obstacles, um, understand your past life and future life, you know, foresight and hindsight, um, the power, right? And Ta Xing Tong, Su Ming Tong, Shen Zhu Tong, able to go anywhere you like, which is what he performs. And then the last one, which is only other hand and above can attain, which is Lo Jing Tong, no longer bound by six rims, no longer leak. Merits no longer leak in terms of you no longer attach um, to the to the life and death. That's a basic. So he practiced many lifetime, and this lifetime he met Buddha, attained Arahant food, and they attained two weeks after learning from Buddha. So Sariputta, right, say, Hey Buddha, Amitofu, uh, uh, Namashaya me Buddha, and in two weeks he gained enlightenment, right? <laughs> How many life have we been learning? I don't know. <laughs> How far away from enlightenment? I don't know. <laughs> right? Um, but Shariputra and uh, Mogalayana, 
easy as um easy as snapping the finger. All right, that's because they have practiced a lot of lifetime. Their past life serves to tell us that. So Mogalayana, uh, back to him, he attained enlightenment. What he did after that is he used this kind of um, miracles to teach uh, everyone, to teach Buddhism. Um, he used these miracles to compete with other, to, to, how to say, to convince the Brahmins, especially when they're trying to be argumentative, combative, they show them these miracles. Of course, Buddha later has a story where um, Buddha is unhappy with using psychic power to teach them, right? Um, <clears throat> but he didn't use that for show off. That's why he's a sage, not a mundane people. He used that to teach them the, like what we talk about, dependent origination, all this, by showing them directly. Right? I can't, I can only describe, you can use your power of understanding to uh, imagine. And I have to use my power of communication to make uh, make it clear uh, as I can. So what he did is just show F, show show to the heavenly beings, show to the um, other beings of what he's doing. So he used this to benefit sentient beings. So he used it correctly. That's that's what Buddha used as well, right? Um, yeah. However, the most important thing of Magalayana, Mogalayana, Venerable Mogalayana, is where his past life lies, Mudian uh, Mu. It's very famous. Actually, Mogalayana's current life, right? In Chinese, we call him Mudian. It's easier to mention it. So, Venerable Mogalayana's, uh, in his present time, uh, his mother has passed away. He was sad. In, uh, no, he was uh, trying to find his mother. Even with the power of Arahant, he could not find his mother because it's too close to his mom, all right? Despite his um, attainment to Arahant, he unable to reach his mother. So he asked to the Buddha, where can, um, why, uh, could you help me uh, to find where my mom is? Because I can't find him. Uh, so Buddha bring Mogalayana to the realm her mom is in, which is the hell. And he's like, of course I want to help my mom to get out of hell. Why, first place, why is his mom in hell? Because cause and effect. Her mom is very greedy and temperous, uh, tempestuous, very easily give in to anger and always make life hard for people around them. So that's a bad habit they have developed and this is the result. So the Buddha has helped him, uh, but you know, at that moment, they can't do anything because she's suffering her own cause and effect. Um, so the Buddha is like, in order to help uh, your mom to get out of hell or hungry ghost realm, uh, Buddha went back to human realm at the 15th of July, right? 15th of July, he gathers everyone because 15th of July happens to be summer and well, India always have summer, right? They don't have four seasons. Um, they, it's a more monsoon, I think it's monsoon season that will be more accurate. Raining, it's not suitable to go out asking for alms, alms, because you will step on animals and stuff like that and it's wet and all that, not convenient. So they all gather in um, one of these viharas, which is the place for, built by the kings for the Sangha to live. And Buddha will give them sermon for three months. Um, Venerable Sheo has the experience when he was a Theravadan, back in Theravadan tradition before he met Master Ching Kong's teaching. So he did that. All, you know, original Buddhism, we all, um, people who follow the Theravadan tradition, which is copying the original, I mean, early, early Buddhism's um, practice, um, they will always do that. Uh, during like Thailand, uh, South or Vietnam as well. So back to the point, um, yeah. So during this time where all the monks, people who cultivate merits gathered, he used, um, you know, he, he, he offered on behalf of his mom, right? He offered on behalf of his mom, preferably buying the most favorite 
ornaments or uh, you know use the ornaments that uh, his mom used to use when she was alive change it into food uh, you know medicine clothings and offer to all the monks so helping to cultivate merits on behalf of her because of her they cultivate the merits and the mom was being uh, transferred to heaven because of this merit alone so that's how this begins where you know uh, we have Ulamba festival uh, that's the original meaning of the festival which is trying to repay our parents you know our ancestors our loved ones by cultivating merits on behalf of them you know, where all our fahui, you know tries yearning ceremony came into fruition it inspires all this in the afterwards because <clears throat> back then there is no fahui, there's no ceremony or anything and the point of ceremony is to remember those who passed um, all the teachings embedded in the ceremony right every time when you hear the the venerable uh, using the wood and uh, chomp, uh, stomping on the on the table like a court judge is trying to tell us to pay attention this is what uh, the verdict the edict of the sage monk you know, Zhong Yun Zhong Feng Chan Si you know, Zen Master Zhong Feng he's barely he's merely repeating the teaching of Buddha and the sage monk before him back to the point Ulamba festival was made into that but if you look at modern times sometimes it becomes a ritual without understanding the meaning uh, it becomes everyone you know use this as a gathering which is all right but it misses the point sometimes sometimes people is like you know dance you know incorporate into the Chinese culture it, it, it dance uh, dance on the stage you know trying to celebrate uh, because the gate of hell is open you know but it has its merits even though it has been diminished into many different forms but you know it's used to remember those people who pass um, they I used to remember I, my family used to have uh, a wood a brick put it out in front of the roadside and then we would light up two candles red color and then offer some teas and buns and in front of the brick and then uh one or two jocks of incense um, as an offer. You know, so that's a practice we've been doing until uh, we left Malaysia. So in Chinese world, it's very common. Uh, and uh, of course, the original meaning is coming from the story of Mogala, uh, Venerable Mogalayana saving his mom. So that's where it came from. It's still affecting us nowadays. And doing San Cecilia is the same thing. Trisidian ceremony is exactly the same thing. You're offering your time, your effort, you know, to, you know, uh, people who are alive, which is us, or people who passed, which is the hungry ghost people. Um, these two realms uh, are most likely to be here, right? Human and hungry ghost, or spiritual beings as well. Uh, <clears throat> so, Venerable Mogalayana has been um, instrumental in teaching Buddhism via miracles and psychic powers. Uh, he demonstrated, uh, it's like a picture speaks a thousand words. So he did, and it, it's effective. Of course, there is a point where Buddha say you can't, um, because psychic power only done by one or two person who would really have that ability. Right? Not everyone can show you properly. Right? And, and it's also problem of people who is less honorable intention using it for money and fame people worship him as you know jesus come again buddha come again right? those sages will perform miracles as well right jesus did that as well muhammad as well so this is easily fake by other people some people might use technology or some tricks to do that so that's not the ultimate way to spread the teachings um, it's not encouraged, you know, only when, you know, right condition like him, he might use it. But in the end of the day, he still have to talk about Dharma, like how we did, you know, like talk about it, explain about it, write it into the book. Eventually, back then there is oral, oral um, teaching, which is by mouth, they teaching um, by words, ver verbs, and then they remember, memorize it, and then they write it on the leaf, leaflets, you know. 
So back to the point, um, Venerable Mogalayana uh, does not have a good ending though. However, before I reach to there, Venerable Mogalayana has another story um, that depicts uh, the futility of psychic power in the face of karmic retribution. Right? We just talk about treaties and response and retribution. Futility of psychic power, you know, all these powerful trick, uh, not tricks, powerful abilities cannot cannot overcome karmic retribution, karmic um, effect. We all know Buddha's family is Sakya clan. And we also know Buddha's family after the passing of the father, his father, and, you know, passing down to the next in line, were butchered, murdered by neighboring king. Forgot the name. In Chinese, it's called Bodhi Wang. So, yeah, this is past life. And Mogalayana, Venerable Mogalayana, trying to save the Buddha's people, you know, picking the top 500 sharpest um, individuals in that city uh, before it was under the siege by the king who trying to massacre all of them so he put them into his um, alms bowl because he can enlarge and put them uh, what do you say miniaturize all these people into a bowl basically so it's like a ship so he fly all the way far far away from there maybe in, all the way to the uh, Trimsaka heaven you know these Taolitian stuff like that he went to the heaven because it's safest right but when he opened up his arm bowl, when he reached the heaven realm, every one of them become a pool of blood. Right? So his whole bowl of 500 people becomes a whole bowl of blood. No, it's not transportation error. It's karmic. Right? They need to overcome. They, they have to face this death. Right? Because their karmic uh, level, uh, effect is overpowering them. They have to f face this death. So Buddha has already tried by stopping in front of his, um, in, in, on the way, uh, stopping close to the city where the Satya cleansed Kapilavasu, outside Kapilavasu, three times. First time and second time, the king, out of respect to Buddha, retreats. Call, he's called off the um, invasion army. But the third time, Buddha uh, has um, understood that he can't do anymore. Because... Um, there is no way to stop this karmic effect. He has to, um, you know, he can't. He did his best, he, so he stepped away. When the Sakya king was being butchered, uh, murdered, Buddha has a headache for three days as well, where he literally couldn't move. He's just having headaches. So later there was, there was there's an explanation Um from the Buddha to everyone, why this happens, why this tragedy happens, sacking of Kapilavatsu happens. Past life, it's always about the fish, guys. Stop eating fish. In the past life, there's a group of fish swimmingly freely in water, in the body of water. Maybe a lake, maybe a river, and then suddenly a net was laid across the whole ocean covering the surface and then reach the depth of it and then grasp on the whole school of fishes, right? Uh, one of them is the head of the school, which means head of the fishes, right? And that head of the fishes is the past life of the king that trying to invade them and murder them. And the whole school of fishes that was being caught and eaten are the armies of the king that is invading them, the Sakya clan. So guess who is the Sakya clan past life was? They were the villagers that caught the fish. All right? And Buddha was one of the villagers. And hence they are like Sakya clan in the current life. But Buddha did not eat them. Buddha used the stick, just hit the head of the, one of the fish three times. Hence, his headache three times. So, karma is very, very accurate. More accurate than your audit accountant that comes into your office. Very accurate. 
Exact, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's why Satya clan has met its demise that way. Uh, but Buddha, of course, fully enlightened, he couldn't be killed. He only can be harmed. Um, so Buddha has um, gone through this karmic debt as well. Even his Buddha, right? It tells us how powerful karmic effect is and futility of using psychic power. Hence the importance of using this method, you know, face to face, you know, spreading the word, propagation is in making everyone aware of this uh, issues. So Mokalaya, uh, and then not enough of that, right? Venerable Mokalayana also met his end under the um, group of heretics or people who, you know, trying to challenge the teachings, but they couldn't because the kings are supporting the Buddha's teaching. Everyone of influence, they people with sound mind, they are supporting him right? because Buddha never used that kind of, you know, I'm the God and something like that. He's using reasons and, you know, he's charisma, charisma as well, right? Um, he's, he's teaching the truth and it's how it is. Everyone flocks to him and there are bound to be jealousies, right? There were data. Uh, then we have this group of people uh, wearing the white clothes and trying to cause ruckus, but without any success because kings are supporting the Buddha. Uh, teaching, propagation. So, Mogalayana happens to be nearby and, you know, wait, Mogalayana comes in November of the same year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, um, there is a group of Jain monk where they also follow the five precepts, but they follow the precepts for the sake of following the precepts. They didn't understand why do you, you just like what I'm talking about, about Leo Fan, talking about keeping yourself clean away from these deeds uh, so that you may go to heaven, something like that, or, or, or so that you may appear uh, reputable, but not willing to, you know, sacrifice your reputation in order to save someone. So basically, this is the mindset of, of them as well. Basically, they are quite attached to the teaching of precepts, forgetting that it's a means to an end, which is full enlightenment. Full enlightenment is very flexible, very well-rounded, very complete, not bound by a little bit of commandments, right? Be careful though, when you follow the teachings, follow it earnestly. But the goal is not to control you using the commandments, it's to use this to drill, like an army, you drill yourself in shape, discipline, form, what to do, what not to do. You cannot pillage, you cannot rape, you cannot murder when you conquer the city, right? All good armies, all armies that are worthy of respect, they come in disciplined, they keep to themselves, eat their own food. If they do want to get food from the people, they buy from the people. They don't murder, pillage, right? They don't rape, right? The army that usually is messed up, you know, that cause a lot of anti-sentiment from our people is people who rape and pillage when they went into the city after they conquer it. That's the difference. Same goes for our cultivation. If you can't drill yourself, can't put yourself in shape, right? In terms of your mental resilience against your desires, uh, in ability to write your own, this expensive device, right? your brain, in, unable to overcome it, then you will be its slave and then you won't be able to gain enlightenment because you'll be caught up by five senses. So, in conclusion, uh, what we're trying to say is precepts is important, but it's a way to put ourselves in shape, not the end of the goal. So, Jain monks are usually get stuck with that way, too stuck in, the, in its own way. In uh, Buddhism, there's a five uh, negative... Um, five um, deviating view. This five view will deviate us from what? Deviate us from the path of enlightenment. Right? One of them is Jie Chu Jian. They basically they, they attach to the to the to the precepts too much. Devatata also using the same thing. Oh I'm using the same rules as the Buddha did, you know, no killing, 
uh, even like Jain, like they are vegetarian as well. And Buddha Sangha does not practice vegetarianism. They just take whatever was given from other people. All right. Be careful. Again, I'm not saying that vegetarianism is uh, deviating from the Buddha's teaching. I'm saying that vegetarianism is just a lifestyle. It's a it's a statement of no killing, and it has merits. It was encouraged by attained enlightened monk, Master Ying Guang, right? Or thousands of monks, right? All the way from Liang Wudi till now, right? Uh, the ancient emperors and all that. Yes, emperor is the lay Buddhist who encourage it, but enlightened monk has followed on to these habits in Chinese Buddhism that monks eat no meat, no living beings. These are good. But Jain was different in that they attached to it too much. They forgot the point of cultivating this is to gain enlightenment. All right? Let go of the attachment, even the vegetarian diet as well. All right? So in our case as well, um, this is just an example. They still have Jainism nowadays. Of course, they don't do that again. Of course, it's a different world. All right? But back then, this group of people jealous, right? They're jealous of Mogalayana of his ability to do miracles so well and also his ability to spread the teaching um, and the Buddha as well, teaching. So he keeps talking about karma, telling them what is heaven, what is hell, why is it happening? Be, ca- be careful of, you know, living your life immorally and blah, blah, blah. And these are important teachings like what we've been talking about, um, cause and effect, right? He used his psychic power as well to drive the point home. Basically, a living PPT, PowerPoint, or even better, AR, augmented reality. He can he let them see as he say it. Basically, he has the ability. And this touches the benefits of interest of the other teachings, like Jainism. Because they can't do as well as Mogalayana and they were jealous. So they trying to gather a group of people um, using the sticks and then just battered to death. So it's a very violent death for uh, Venerable Mogalayana. However, remember, a person with psychic power, you know, you can fly, you can hear people thousands of miles away. We saw Marvel's movie. We saw all this superhero movie, right? The worldly's point of view is how can they touch him unless he's also a superpower human right of course they can't touch him he can just not be there because he can hear them thousands of miles away but why is he allowing him to meet the end like this right because his time is up you understand that oh i have done my job here now i need to go back so i need to repay the debt as well my as well so that's his mindset in a sense he's like oh let's pay some debt you know i owe them of course, if you don't owe them, they won't suddenly want to kill you. There's no such thing, okay? Um, <clears throat> also, the timing of his death is matching very closely to the Buddha's Parinirvana, when Buddha's gone. Basically, Buddha is like a main character that came to the world. Everyone, like, side characters supporting him. And then when he passed, each of them, people who need to continue passing down, they will stay back. Like, Moha Jaye which I will mention it later, the first, the second patriot of um, uh, Zen, not Zen, uh, Chan Buddhism, Jhana Buddhism, Indian Zen Buddhism, right? Before it was Zen, before it's Chan, is Jhana, J-H-A-N-A, the, or, the original Chan Zhong, you know, the original Zen in India. First one is Buddha himself, second one is him, right? Where he, Buddha plucks a flower, in front of thousands of crowds, uh, uh, Sangha, and only he smiled. Everyone was like, huh? What? He smiled. He understand what Buddha means without saying anything. And say, Buddha's like, you will, you have inherited my heart. You read, your heart is my heart. That means you, your will is my will. You are the Buddha. You see what the Buddha sees, All right? Even Arahan hasn't reached that level. Arahan just attained first level. He has attained Anuttara Samyasa body in a sense. To be honest, they are Buddha Bodhisattvas. They already have. Um, some of them are Buddha, come again. Uh, so, back to the point 
all right, is uh, Venerable Vodokalayana passed away very closely to the death of um, Buddha, uh, like a few months after, I think. Yeah, November of the same year as Buddha's passing. And he's 84 years old. So why is he allowing himself to be killed? Right? Why? Uh, why a great Anlatiman suffers such an end? But Buddha says, because... Oh, no, I'm see me as the Buddha's passing. Okay, cool. Um, Mogalayana has contracted such karma in previous life. I'm reading all freaky. Murders of one parent is one of the highest weakness. Hey, there was, you cannot read the god. Oh, okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, there's a result. So, okay, yeah, he did the same thing in the past. All right, especially serious karma, the five transgression. Um, so, yeah, of course, what becomes of the bandit that killed him? The king was very angry. So he captured every single, you know, those bandits. This, they are no longer practitioner. They are bandits. Basically, they are basically it's like someone who is eighty years old and very respected, venerated by all the kings and stuff because his Buddha's teacher, students and stuff was killed. So you can imagine the king was like, nope. So he captured all of them, execute all of them. However, that's not the point. The point is he has a karma to pay. And on his way back to Buddha's teaching in different realms, he's like, might as well return it. I'm pretty sure that's the mindset. Um, I'll stop here. So that's the story of uh, Venerable Mogalayana and Venerable Shariputra. Both are friends from young, from the same place, you know, same town, hometown, gone to the world outside at a very young, tender age, but very wise, very sharp form their own entourage, follow Buddha's teaching, gain enlightenment within a few weeks, all right, and spread the teachings wide and far. And you can see how much mentions of, uh, especially um, Shariputra in almost every sutra, next to Ananda, 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 uh, uh, and then Shariputra, Shariputra, right? Anan, Anan, Salifu, Salifu. So there's so many mentions. That means they are instrumental in working with Buddha to perform a concert of Dharma propagation. It's very important. So I'll stop here and I hope my um, story is not too confusing. Uh, if you want to remember Venerable, Shari, uh, remember Venerable uh, Shariputra for his famous past life exploit of giving up his eyes. Uh, is it past life or this life? Give me a sec. How do you know it's past life or this life? Uh, Prashna Parimbata Sutra. Uh, no is it past life? No idea. Okay, it's past life. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's a past life. He was he already pursued Bodhisattva in the past, um, but he gave up and become you know the the Shravaka, the you know the only take care of yourself kind of a mindset. Of course, that's. Um, that will re reverse when, when he met Buddha this lifetime. So the point right now is um, remember him for that, okay? And also remember him for his, you know, mention in a lot of Buddha Sutra. So what about Venerable Mogalayana? Very famous, right? Hungry Ghost Festival. That's because of him, all right? He's trying to save his mom and his mom is suffering and hence he asked the Buddha's help. Buddha enlisted the help of, not enlisted, he, he, he went... He was there, he's teaching the Sangha of um, people, group of people on the July 15th. Uh, used that merit transfer to the um, uh, to the uh, mother of uh, Venerable uh, Mogalayana. And remember him for, you know, showing how futile psychic power is in the face of karmic depths. And hence the importance of holding fast to our um, conduct, you know, and understand, you know, the consequences we have to face. Uh, so hopefully this is um, the message I send across to everyone here and who will be reading it in future. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, let's do dedication of merits. May the merits and virtues adorn the Buddha's pure land, repay the four kinds of kindness above and relieve the sufferings of those in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this all bring forth the heart of understanding and compassion. 
and leave the teachings for the rest of this life, then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. A mi to fo, 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 a mi to fo